A con man is the worst sort of human being. But here's one who had the demise of at least eight women under his belt and a missing baby, too. This is the story of how a lifetime con man turned into the world's first internet serial killer. John Edward Robinson lived a very mundane life. He was an Eagle Scout, a choir boy, and an aspiring priest in his youth. But he had a dark side that would soon lead him, little by little, into the most abhorrent of human actions. John became a con man early in life. He dropped out of Quigley Preparatory Seminary in Chicago for disciplinary reasons. He managed to get in two years of college to be a radiographer, but quit that too. That didn't stop him from getting a job, however. He worked fraudulently at several hospitals where he was apprehended again and again. Stealing, embezzling, defrauding, and several dalliances with women's staff members. Over and over, he was found guilty of white-collar offenses, but somehow avoided any serious punishments. This guy even threw himself a Man of the Year banquet. He wrote fake letters of recommendation to city board members and ordered his own plaque in an attempt to defraud the community. He barely got a slap on the wrist. At what point should white-collar offenses be considered the start of something worse? John conned his way through most of his life, coming up with one scheme after another in an effort to strike it rich even started phony companies to gain investments and profits just to close the doors and run away with it all. By the mid-1980s, he was happily married to Nancy Jo Lynch and a father of four. He was a church elder and scoutmaster living a pious life in Kansas City, Missouri. He was also a money-hungry predator of women. In 1984, he placed an ad in the newspaper for a sales rep for one of his many startups. Paula Godfrey answered the ad. It was the last job she would ever take. After meeting with John, Paula told her family she had to go away for training. No one ever saw her again. Paula's dad, William, confronted John who claimed no knowledge of her. A short time later, Paula's family received a typed letter signed with Paula's signature. She said she was fine. She just didn't want to be bothered. Eventually, the letter stopped too. In 1985, John founded another fraudulent company, the Kansas City Outreach Program. He claimed it was a charity in place to help women in need. He told women's shelters he could offer jobs, GED tests, and housing for single moms. What he really had in mind was far more sickening. That's how he met Lisa Stassi when she came to him for help. He put her up in a hotel and promised her a job and daycare for her baby girl, Tiffany. She called a family member crying, saying that she was being asked to sign blank pieces of paper, but had to hang up quickly. No one ever heard from her again, or her baby girl. But her family got a letter, a typewritten letter signed with Lisa's signature. It stated that she was fine and starting a new life with her daughter. She wanted to be on her own. Catherine Clampett disappeared in 1987. After taking a job with John at a management consulting firm he started. 1987 was also the year that John Edward Robinson finally started paying for his cons. From 1987 through 1993, John was in and out of prison for various fraud and embezzlement charges. While in prison, he started an extramarital liaison with the married prison librarian, Beverly Bonner. After his release, Beverly left her husband, ran away with John, and was never seen again. Her alimony checks still found their way into John's bank account, though. That's when the internet happened, and it took John's game to a whole new level. 
By the mid-1990s, John Robinson had five computers running at all time, constantly trolling for an easy target. He developed a few websites, including a dating site for a dominant, submissive subculture. John Robinson had found the perfect hunting ground. It had never been easier for him to con unsuspecting women into taking their final trip into his fiendish clutches. Sheila Faith met John online. He promised to pay for her 15-year-old daughter, Debbie's, cerebral palsy surgery and finally get her out of her wheelchair. They disappeared immediately after arriving in Kansas City from California. Sheila's pension checks made their way into John's bank account for the next seven years. Isabella Lewicka met John online too. She got the same promises of a great job and a nice apartment as everyone else. But she had another job to do as a love servant. She had met John on a submissive website and signed a contract stating she was his personal love servant. It gave him complete control over every aspect of her life, including her bank accounts. She disappeared shortly after starting work for John in 1999. The year 2000 was the beginning of the end for John Robinson. While the world celebrated the new century, Suzette Troughton moved from Michigan to Kansas to travel the world with John as his submissive and nurse to his father. In a matter of months, her family started to suspect something. Her emails didn't sound like her, and her beloved Pekingese dogs were found abandoned. Suzette's mom, Carolyn, called John, who told her Suzette was fine. She was off on a boating adventure with a new boyfriend. When she wanted to call the police, he told her not to. Soon after, Suzette's family started to receive signed, typewritten letters from her. John's life spiraled into even more depraved behavior in the early 2000s. He kept meeting more women from all over the country with the same subculture fantasies, but allowed them to live after severe pains. Once he scared them into submission, he took everything they had. He then left them penniless in seedy hotels, alone in an unfamiliar city for days, and often made them sell themselves. He would take their pictures in compromising situations and threaten to publish them online if they didn't obey his wishes, which always included access to all their bank accounts. One woman finally escaped and called the police, which started the unbelievable discoveries that led to his arrest. Investigations on John were already underway. All the missing women cases were stacking up against him. Unbeknownst to John, detectives had been staking out his house and knew his movements. When these startling new reports came in, it was all police needed to issue search warrants for property owned by John Edward Robinson. Dogs trained to alert to the scent of decomposing flesh led police to the remains of Suzette and Isabella on John's ranch property. They were crammed into 85-gallon drums and hidden in a brush line behind a deteriorating shed. When police searched his storage facility, they found Sheila and her daughter, Debbie, along with Beverly. Searches of his home came up with blank stationery signed by his targets and hotel receipts in their names, including a receipt for Lisa Stassi and her baby daughter. It was a cut and dry case. The evidence was overwhelming. Further investigation revealed one tiny glimmer of hope through all the despair. John had brokered a fake adoption of an infant girl at the time of Lisa's disappearance. The family who adopted her was John's own brother, Don Robinson. John knew his brother and his wife were desperate for a baby. He told them he knew an adoption lawyer who just happened to have a new baby girl. 
After collecting a legal fee of over $5,000, he gave them Lisa Stasi's little girl. She was 15 years old and had a new name, Heather. When she found out the man she thought of as an uncle was a sadistic monster. Autopsy reports showed in trial indicated the missing women were all bludgeoned with a hammer. John Edward Robinson was found guilty in the cases of Beverly Bonner, Isabella Lewicka, Sheila Faith, and Suzette Trotton, those whose remains were found. He was also found guilty for those whose remains still hadn't been found, Lisa Stassi, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett. He received the ultimate penalty of capital punishment. The Kansas Supreme Court upheld the sentence in 2015. In 2007, Lisa Stassi's daughter, Heather Tiffany Robinson, won a judgment that prevents John Robinson from ever profiting from his story. Do you think it's possible to reach John's level of con in today's age of cybersecurity? How do you think he stayed under police radar for so long? Let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content just like this.